What I want to talk about is some trends that are coming for the next five to ten years that are going to change how we approach testing, what we can and cannot test easily, and how the whole pricing structure of testing is going to change. And that's going to open up some really interesting possibilities. So there's a couple of trends that are affecting the industry globally, I think. One of the most important trends that's happening at the moment is a front-end fragmentation, where 10 years ago, it was perfectly fine to test your software in two major browsers and then say, you know, that's fine. Um, now it's all over the place. There's kind of Android, there's iOS, there's 30 different versions of Android. People use the stock browser on Android and the Chrome browser on Android. They use lots of different weird things, and that's going to affect how we test and, and, and what we test. It's already affecting stuff. It's making testing stupidly more expensive. And um, it's making people expect weird things. For example, I'm building a collaboration tool at the moment, and we published on the website, we support Android, unfortunately. And we got a bug report that our software doesn't work on a Samsung fridge. I mean, fuck it, yeah. So, um, and kind of things like that will happen more and more. Uh, you know, we're getting... Um, front-end devices like car systems now, or watches, or I got an Amazon Echo at my home where there's no screen anymore, you just talk to it, and things like that. So the, the front-end fragmentation is becoming more and more as a, of a problem, and that's going to create more problems for us to test. The other trend that's happening now is the push to the cloud. And Gartner estimates that um, this kind of by 2017, there's going to be about 65% of companies that have some kind of weird on-cloud, on-premise hybrid system running. So that's end of next year. Now, analyst companies often have kind of people on drugs predicting weird futures, but um, regardless of what the actual number is, I, I think, you know, people are deploying more and more stuff to the cloud. And... Running stuff on cloud opens up some really interesting challenges where we no longer have any control over the hardware that we're running on. Uh, one of the most revolutionary things that happened last year was the launch of AWS Lambda. Um, it's absolutely amazing. We've been using it for about six months now and deleted about 90% of our infrastructure code migrating from something that was running on Heroku. So from a programming perspective, it's amazing. From a control perspective, it's scary because you just give it a function to execute. You have no idea how many machines it's running on at the moment, if it's running, if it's stopped, if it's hot, if it's cold, if it was suspended halfway through and then distributed to 10 more machines. Uh, no control over that at all. And where, for example, 15 years ago, I worked with a company where they invested a ton of money in buying an immortal kit. Hardware that never died, where you just didn't have to worry about any of that because kind of it just worked. And now we are deploying stuff on who knows how many machines that die all the time, but we don't even know that they died. And that changes the risk profile of what we need to, need to do quite a lot. And the, the, kind of the third thing that I think is happening is part of the fragmentation trend is the number of devices and device types that are connecting and how we're distributing software and where the software is actually going to run is changing the risk profiles as well. Even five years ago, most of the software we used to have run on the server where companies I work with now kind of run quite a lot of logic in the user interface now on the mobile phones, on the devices. And this whole Internet of Things trend is coming where, again, Gartner IDC and other people have weird estimates. Gartner estimates that um, pretty much at this point, there's about 5.1 billion devices connected to the Internet in one way or another. And that by 2020, we're going to have 20 billion devices connected there. ABI research says that that number is closer to 40 billion devices. And IDC estimates that the market for services and market for kind of Internet of Things is going to be worth about $7 trillion by 2020. So if you're thinking about, oh, you know, this whole website programming doesn't look like I'm going to make a lot of money in, 
you know, Internet of Things is the way to go. Of course, nobody knows what it is, but it doesn't matter. So, um, kind of, so th th those are things that are going to affect how we test stuff and what we can and cannot test and what we have to test because they're changing the risk profile quite a lot. And at the same time, these are things that are opening up some really new interesting opportunities. Like AWS announced the launch of the X1 instance that has two terabytes of RAM last month. Anything you ever wanted to keep in RAM, pretty much you can now. And it doesn't cost anything if you want to run it for a couple of hours. If you want to keep it there for, you know, two years, you're probably going to have to sell your apartment for that. But if you want to run something for two hours in memory and have two terabytes of RAM to do that, that's okay. It's almost no, no money to do that. And they're also kind of launching all sorts of weird stuff that you can do on the cloud for almost no money. Like AWS Lambda is almost free for kind of the kind of services that at least I run on it. And we have a site that has something like 2 million active users. We're paying $20 a month to run stuff there. So um, kind of the, 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 the risk profiles are changing, but we also have new opportunities. So the first opportunity that I think is going to be opened up by this is the balance of what's expected and unexpected is going to significantly change in the future. Um, there was this great blog post on Quora a couple of uh, years ago where they said we just hired this Vietnamese guy whose last name is Null, and that completely broke all our systems. <laughs> and, you know, th th that's kind of unexpected. Uh, there, was a, there was a lady in the U.S., um, was a vegetarian activist, something very strange to, I guess, anybody in the audience that vegetarians might have activists, but... Um, she, she kind of wants to promote vegetarianism for, you know, whatever insane reason and decided to change her name legally to the domain name of the organization she works with. That's kind of govec.com because she now has a dot in the name that broke all sorts of weird U.S. government systems and things like that. We, we still think are unexpected. Most of the industry doesn't test for stuff like that. It's done with exploratory testing, but you know, it's, it's 2016 now, having an umlaut in a name or having kind of a weird Unicode thing or, or you know, it's, it's not really unexpected. You know, we, we know about these things. We've been knowing about these things for a while. There are databases of that stuff already. For example, Max Wolf published a database on GitHub that's called the Big List of, big list of Naughty Strings. About 64K of strings that tend to break shit. Now, you know, that's out there. It's, it's, no, it's, it's no longer unexpected to have that. There, there was a um, uh, uh, famous uh, incident with Skype last, month, last year where if you start typing in a link and you type in HTTP colon and then press enter, the client breaks so badly you have to uninstall it. Restarting doesn't help. Now, that kind of stuff is not really unexpected. I mean, it's in the database here. It's an invalid URL. So um, we can't claim that these things are really unexpected. And again, there, there are tools that are helping people remember these things. I wrote Bug Magnet. That's kind of a Chrome extension where you can right click on any input field, get a list of menus to say, oh, valid addresses, invalid addresses, weird names, weird characters for people to test this stuff. But we're all, you know, most of the industry is testing for these things manually now. And we're claiming that's exploratory. It's not, it's expected. You're expected, especially launching stuff online to so many people, for people to put in crap there. Maliciously, unintentionally, but kind of people will put in crap. We have to test against that. And the problem why most people claim this is all unexpected and exploratory is just too expensive to automate any of that. As a technique, mutation testing has been around for 30 years where, you know, we randomly can change the code or the system under test and kind of see what happens. It's just, if we try to do this for all the strings and all the input fields on all the browsers, on all the mobile devices, it's just too stupidly expensive. That's why we don't do that. But I think with the opportunities that the cloud is opening now, that thing is going to become ridiculously cheap. For example, I don't know how, you know, how much money it would take to create your own device farm where you have all the possible versions of Android and then you're tracking that, you're installing stuff on it, you're updating it with all the different versions of the operating systems. It's ridiculously expensive. But you don't have to do that. Amazon is running that for you and it's selling it to you at almost no cost. AWS device farm allows anybody to kind of relatively cheaply test stuff on all sorts of weird combination of physical devices, 
not, not emulators, physical devices that they are going to operate for you. And you can kind of script stuff, you can see what it looks like, you can run. There are services emerging now like browser stack that allow you to see how your website looks like in all weird combinations of operating systems and browsers and very, very quickly see how it's going to behave. And there are cloud services now emerging that can even support some basic automated testing workflows. Like Source Labs is allowing people to run a Selenium test over 500 combinations of browsers and operating systems in parallel and give you kind of back the results. So this costs a bit now. It's not trivially cheap, but I think with kind of the general trend of cloud infrastructure and cloud services coming up, this thing is going to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And we'll be able to cover device fragmentation relatively easily if we have the tools to properly automate and test that. And I, I don't think that Selenium is the right solution for that. I think we'll have to wait for a new generation of tools to actually emerge there so we can run these things nicely. But I, I really hope that, you know, five years from now, there's lots of relatively cheap cloud services where we can do these things. Even today, um, if you're really worried about how your website looks like in Internet Explorer 6 and you don't have a Windows machine like I don't, um, th that's kind of relatively cheap and relatively easy to use one of these services. It's much, much cheaper than having people to maintain Windows machines in your company. So, um, the... So I think that the first really amazing opportunity that is going to open up is we'll be able to do mutation testing. Not just how does this look, we'll be able to combine Max Wolf's list with 64K of strings that break shit, automate it and then run that in parallel on, you know, 7,000 combinations of devices, operating systems, blah, blah, blah. And that will be integrated in the CI pipeline. Ten minutes after you commit, you will get a report that, hey, we tried this on the Samsung fridge and it doesn't work. Is this a problem for you or not? And kind of things like that. Now, that's stupidly expensive, but I think because the, you know, the, 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 the data is in place, the tools are coming there, that's going to become ridiculously cheap very soon. So that, that's kind of one aspect of what's happening on the cloud. The other thing that is happening at the moment is, of course, kind of human cloud integrations are becoming really in more interesting. So Amazon has, apart from just running kind of these robots on devices, also has a service called Mechanical Turk that allows you to kind of give a task to people online to do. They're not particularly intelligent people and you can't really expect a lot of intelligence from them, but something that you can, you can't really script in Selenium or you can't really kind of uh, automate any other way. You want humans to actually look at it. You can do that relatively cheaply and ask, for example, for 10,000 people to come and click a button. Or ask people from lots of different regions in the world to try and kind of do something manually. And that is also ridiculously cheap. Now, kind of that opens up some really, really interesting opportunities because fair enough, we can script stuff, we can automate stuff, but we'll never be able to kind of fully replace unexpected shit that users do. Like, I had this case a couple of months ago where we started getting a ton of error, automated error reports from Spain. We have error tracking in the browser and we started getting a lot of automated error reports from Spain on a software that's not localized at all. So it makes no sense for one territory to start generating errors. And then we tracked down one of the users that kind of had a lot of errors in the browser and tried to figure out what he's doing. And he was using Google Translate to translate our site to Spanish. Now, I made the stupid mistake of using a label on a button in the code to kind of try and figure out what's going on. And because Spanish people have these weird quote question marks that kind of start and, and close a sentence, our stuff broke because I tried to use something with a weird Unicode character in the code. And th this kind of stuff is truly Okay, not really unexpected now, but for me then was unexpected. So we can get real humans to actually kind of try and do this. And if we're thinking about getting some kind of testing expertise there, there, there are already other services that are focused on testing. For example, there's user testing that can bring people to kind of, that fit your user profile to try your website or to try a prototype. So you want people who are, I don't know, music lovers, they are in this age category, they're from this territory, you want them to try out your software, you can do that now on the cloud. And that 
costs money, but it costs a lot less money than actually going and finding those people yourself. And you can do this in a way that is kind of at the moment relatively manual. It's not managed, it's not integrated, it's not scheduled. But what, what I would really love to see is five years from now, there's a CI integration for this, where after I commit, a thousand people do a usability test. And that comes back in my CI test results, saying that, oh, you've done this change, people are no longer finding this link that easily. Maybe you've cocked up. Or, oh, you've done this change, people are going through this workflow much faster. It's really, really interesting. It's good. It's, you know, you've done a good change. So we can start automating that, pa that part of the test that really requires a human eye. And I think that's really, really interesting. So, of course, there'll be services that are going to offer, oh, you know, we have 10,000 testers here that are really, really good testers and are going to test your software just on demand. I, I don't think that's kind of the true value of this. Outsourcing testing has long been kind of a false promise and nothing really good came out of that. But I think distributing this and managing this is a challenge. So we have services now like Amazon Turk, like user testing, where you can actually kind of schedule this, but it's all manual. And if somebody sends me like a thousand videos to watch, I, I nothing to do with that. It's going to waste my time quite a lot. But I, I hope in about five years' time, or assume in five years' time, somebody's going to do management of this because the management part is really missing. So I think with kind of um, cloud services and kind of human cloud integration and things like that, what we're going to start seeing is coordination tools for this that are integrated in CI where real users with statistically relevant numbers can do something. So we can now say, okay, as a, you know, a designer comes in and says, well, I expected people to click more on this. We run a test and we see if people are clicking more on this or not. And that's all integrated into the pipeline, kind of statistically relevant. Not something like, oh, you know, my uncle clicked on this twice and he didn't like the color, so we have to change it. And I think that's going to start changing kind of the, the, the profile of what we can and cannot automate quite a lot. Because at the moment, usability testing is all kind of in this realm of, well, maybe if we have time and it costs too much, and then we do it with five people, and then we have to think that you know, their opinion is valid or not, where in the future that's going to become ridiculously cheap. So, of course, with, with testing, there's a ton of stuff that is unpredictable. There's a part of testing that's testing for predictable things. That's kind of unit testing, acceptance testing, checking for stuff. But there's also part of testing that's looking for unexpected stuff which we'll never be able to fully automate because it's unexpected. If I can automate it, then I'm checking for expected things. And this is where I think the, the, the biggest benefit of people who are testing experts is going to come from in the future. And at the moment, that kind of testing is stupidly expensive. That's why people rarely do that. And that's why we have to rely on kind of experts that have to waste time preparing the context and exploring this stuff. But I think in the future, we'll have much better tools to assist humans in making decisions. For example, there's a whole branch of testing that emerged last kind of 10 years called approval testing, where people don't really know what's going to come out, but they automate stuff in a way that does the whole workflow and then presents the result. And then a human can say, well, Yes, this kind of makes sense, it's okay, or this doesn't make sense, we have something problematic there. So this is where the, the, the process of executing a test is automated, but the decision is left to the human whether this is good or bad, and where we don't really have any clear expectations up front, kind of the thing comes at the end. The first tool like this that I know, at least, that came out is text test, where it will compare log files, it will compare any kind of text output of the system in a really clever way and present only the differences. So you can run stuff through kind of after a change and then you can say, oh, kind of these two things changed in the text file. That's good, that's my new baseline or <gasps> go back and fix it. And this kind of is figuring out how to present things that changed is a really interesting thing. So this is solved for text, but not all systems kind of are okay just to inspect in text. There's lots and lots going on, especially with fr front-end fragmentation. And one of the really interesting things that I think is happening now, at least in the gaming community, is um, the, the game called No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky is it's supposed to come out, it was supposed to come out by this talk, but they've postponed it again. 
it's an amazing thing if you're a sp kind of into space exploration because they have a mathematically generated universe that's going to suppo supposed to have 18 quintillion words, worlds. Each of these worlds should be playable as long as you want. They have planets where you can land, you can spend 10 years playing each of these worlds, there's 18 quintillion worlds there, and they're trying to make each of these worlds realistic, grounded in physics, grounded in biology. So what they have kind of uh, the, 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 is this thing that the director um, of design, Grant Duncan, calls the big box of math, where they put in physical models of Earth's animals, like lions and giraffes, and then this thing kind of extends the neck of a lion or paints giraffes differently. So you, you're supposed to see something reasonable when you land on each of these worlds. You're supposed to see houses with roofs on and windows and things like that. So they model this stuff, but how do you test this stuff? I mean, first of all, there's no expected result. It's randomly generated. It's supposed to be interesting. Second thing is there's 18 quintillion worlds, and for each of these worlds, there's so much data there that... You know, a human in a lifetime cannot test a single world there. And what they've done is they've approached this thing from an approval testing perspective, and they've done what NASA did for space. They've created software probes that fly through this space and film videos what they're seeing. And then in their development room, they have lots of kind of screens where they're showing what the probes are seeing. And then people watch this thing and say, oh, you know, this is nice. Or, hey, you know, this giraffe has legs on her head. Stop, pause, figure out the algorithm, tweak the algorithm, and then kind of regenerate and run again. So they, they, they're not doing testing through the kind of what's expected. They're figuring out whether there's something weird going on by having these probes fly through the system and kind of record stuff. And I think that's really, really interesting as a way of testing stuff because they've automated the process of collecting all this data that's horribly difficult, and they've left it, left it to humans to kind of look and inspect. And I think we'll be seeing much more of that, especially with kind of the complexities of the system and the front-end fragmentations going on. There's already a bunch of tools emerging in this space, especially for websites. For example, BBC wrote a tool called Wraith that's going to compare two screenshots and just point out the differences. So, you know, your designer can come and change stuff, and then you do it and say, well, this is the stuff they change. It looks like, you know, the letters are bolder now. Is this good? Is this not good? And just inspect the changes. The whole process of collecting the data is there for you, and it's very, very easy kind of to compare these changes. There are tools that are already creating some workflow around this. For example, Zebia Visual Review has a workflow where after you commit, it's going to run a bunch of tests, it's going to present you with a screenshot and say, well, you know, on this button, this button is now wider, approve or reject. Like text test is doing, and then you can say approve, this screenshot becomes a new baseline, or reject, hey, test failed, CI fails, we have to do a bunch of things. And this is kind of on premise, but again, there are some tools that are bringing the cloud in as well. And the combination of these kind of browsers and, and operating systems. DOM Reactor, for example, allows you to visually compare how your site looks in two browsers and just kind of points out the differences. You can see kind of that the top part is different. So you can very quickly inspect what's going on. And rather than having to manually go through a bunch of these things, what I assume is going to start happening very soon is we'll have this kind of automated and mixed with things like device farm and, and mixed with things like source labs where it will run 500 tests, but I don't have to inspect all of them manually. It's going to point out small differences for me so I can say approve, approve, approve. Or even better, the designers can say approve, 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 rather than kind of developers having to approve any of that. So kind of Apply Tools is a really interesting tool that's coming to get in this space because they're doing videos. They're doing... Um, kind of a, a fly through the application, similar to how No Man's Sky has probes. Apply Tools is kind of allowing you to fly through the application and script it using Selenium or MS coded UI or a bunch of other things. So you can have not just how, you know, a, a simple, this is how it looks on this page. You can go through a whole workflow and then just see visual differences in the workflow. At the moment, it doesn't have any of that kind of nice development tool integration thing, but I, you know, it's not far-fetched that somebody's going to build that, that stuff relatively quickly. And I hope we'll start seeing that more and more and more, and I hope they'll integrate something like that with one of the geekiest projects I've seen recently, and that's Tapsterbot, 
from Jason Huggins. Jason, who kind of I, he was one of the original people that started Selenium, built a robot, self-printed on a 3D printer that kind of taps stuff with a pen on a mobile phone. So physically tests stuff. So you can actually test end-to-end -end on a device rather than simulating stuff. And uh, connecting to the accessibility API that is, I, I think, at the moment, the only way devices are actually tested. And I think something like this at scale, kind of, he, he open sourced the project. If Amazon takes this and builds a device farm thing with this stuff, you can do fly-throughs of your mobile applications on 500 devices, on weird operating systems with actual usage, not you know, hopefully the simulator works okay, actual, actual usage. And I hope, you know, if Amazon does this, I assume it's going to become ridiculously cheap, like anything else. So my next prediction is that kind of mixing automated cloud services and kind of this whole probing thing and um, all these kind of tools that are emerging now that compare videos, that compare screenshots, are going to help us just test on a lot of kind of space of fragmented things, not really looking for anything in particular, just looking for weird changes. And that's going to change the whole exploratory testing kind of pricing structure and mechanics. So um, the other thing that's happening in this space now, of course, kind of um, is pushed towards the user interface and the, the, the running logic in the user interface and especially kind of visual stuff that's very, very difficult to automate at the moment. We can look for unexpected things there, but it's difficult to express expectations how the objects will be on the screen because of small device differences. There's a couple of tools emerging in this space. The first one is Jim Shore's Quixote that is a unit testing tool for layouts where in a very similar way to how we're doing unit testing at the moment, um, he can express stuff like, oh, this button is supposed to be 10 pixels below this, or this is supposed to be glued to the left edge, or this is supposed to kind of be on the top edge and slightly down or below or above. And there's a technical capability to test layouts now. Um, this is kind of overly technical, and unfortunately, you know, no designer is ever going to do this, so we'll still have this divide of developers and designers, but the technical execution pipeline is there. We just need something that reads much better. There's a tool called Galen Framework that automates a lot of the workflow around this and allows people to express layout tests so you can run it on lots of different devices and browsers and stuff like that automatically not just as a kind of small unit test in, in your environment. But I think these things are fundamentally flawed still because they require a developer to still understand what the designer wants and then code it and then kind of code it as a test. And then when the test passes, it's a developer's opinion. But there's another kind of set of apps that are emerging now that are useful for visual prototyping. And I think combi the combination of these two is really, really going to be interesting. For example, pop-up allows people to mock up an app by drawing stuff and then taking photos of that and then saying, well, you know, this is a button, this is a label, this is, and creating a UI prototype just by taking photographs and marking what's what and what flows to what. And then showing that to users very quickly to kind of work through that. And I think a combination of something like that, that would allow a designer to sit down and draw it on paper and say, I expect this to be 10 pixels, I expect this to be kind of slightly off. I expect this to be here. I expect this to be there. So they can visually describe this thing and then technically execute it through something like Quixote or Galen framework would be amazing because rather than having to interpret stuff and reinterpret and kind of go through the whole workflow, we can have designers actually doing their own automated testing here. And I think that that would be absolutely amazing. So I think um, what will happen as a combination of these things is new languages for describing layout tests will emerge. And new ways of describing how something should look visually will help shorten the loop between kind of design feedback. And that, that, that I think is going to be really, really amazing because most of the time I fight with designers that claim I didn't understand what they wanted. Um, so we can finally kind of avoid the whole thing. Now, the next opportunity that kind of starts opening up uh, in this space is dealing with things that are absolutely impossible to predict. Um, there will always be things that are impossible to predict, even kind of when we're looking for unexpected stuff, 
we can see, oh, this is weird, this is weird, but then kind of outliers happen. And there was this famous article by Mary Poppendick uh, in 2011 when she wrote about the differences how Terminal 5 at London Heathrow and Terminal 3 in Beijing opened up, where when Terminal 5 launched on the first day, they lost all the bags, and it kind of it was absolute chaos. It was three weeks of chaos for everybody who was supposed to go through there. And at the end, they had to send the bags to an airport in Italy, get it sorted and get it back at a huge expense and kind of, uh, there was a parliamentary inquiry after that. But when Terminal 3 in Beijing launched, it launched flawlessly. On the first day, everything worked. And Mary wrote about how that was because in Beijing they had 7,000 volunteers come and do a couple of simulations where they would say, you're going to be a terrorist, you've lost your baggage, you know exactly where to go, you are a security worker who's kind of forgotten a pass, you have to kind of get locked in a toilet for some reason and things like that. And then they've done a lot of these tests to actually figure out how the thing is going to work. And the big conclusion was that, you know, the UK terminal should have done exploratory testing as well, but then, you know, in China you can do that cheaply because the Chinese army can do it, where, in, you know, in, in Europe you can't do that that cheaply. Actually, after the parliamentary inquiry in the UK, they've published uh, papers on how they've done about 80 simulations in the UK with real people, with kind of statistically significant numbers. There were a couple of thousand volunteers involved in, in this whole thing, but unfortunately they were looking for wrong things. And that, that's why kind of with, even with the best intentions and the best exploratory testing and everything, unexpected things will still happen. And the fragmentation of devices like, you know, the fragmentation of front ends is going to cause more and more problems for us because something that works perfectly in Chrome 36.4.5 on my machine might not at all work in the next minor version that they've published. And I think kind of what's going to be more and more interesting in the future is running monitoring on users' devices. We've already seen this with kind of analytics app for mobile devices where they can record application crashes and report back. And there are services like uh, Hotjar. Hotjar is kind of Google Analytics on steroids where it gives you heat maps, it gives you user journeys, it gives you segmentation, it gives you lots and lots of stuff visually by monitoring stuff in user devices. Plus, there are services like TrackJS that can track errors in users' browsers and kind of do something sensible with that, get statistics, report all that in a kind of reasonable way. So when you have two million users, you know, of course you'll get some errors because people have ad blockers, people have kind of content blockers, people are stupid, people have old devices. There's a ton of errors there that are just creating noise. That's one of the biggest problems with monitoring errors is filtering out the noise. And these two tools are starting to do that for us. So I think mixed with the existing tools where we have kind of crash analytics or front-end analytics, and especially kind of running things on users' devices now, new services will emerge to kind of report this. Now, this thing opens up a couple of really interesting opportunities because exploratory testing can only kind of report the stuff we're looking for. And, you know, figuring out something that's unexpected actually requires humans. Humans are unpredictable and kind of requires humans to look at stuff. And that's why lots and lots of companies are now moving to a gradual release system. Facebook is famous for deploying all the new features to something like 0.1% of their users. And then if there's nothing unexpected there, then deploy to, you know, 1% of the users. If there's nothing unexpected, deploy to 10% of the users. If there's nothing unexpected, they keep deploying it. And that thing completely changes a lot of things in terms of how we approach testing. For example, performance testing for most people running large-scale websites is a huge problem because you have to have a replica of your production kit. And especially kind of if you're running stuff on the cloud, that's almost impossible because, you know, <coughs> I have no idea what they're running stuff on. So... <coughs> in the future is a combination of something like Apple Tools and Mechanical Turk, where we'll be able to say, look, I don't want to deploy this to production 1% of my users. I want to deploy this to <coughs> a subset 
of my test population where I'll bring 10,000 users to actually test it, and we'll separate them out, we'll look at these reports, and we'll integrate that into the build pipeline. We'll use something like Hotjar and Truck.js and kind of new tools that emerge in that space. They're going to detect anomalies, detect unexpected stuff, and present it in a good way with heat maps and things like that, present it with differences. So I think we'll be able to start doing automated tests for behavior changes, where at the moment it's all about kind of hoping that something will happen okay, and trying to figure out what's really changing on the system. Are people clicking more? Are people clicking less? And with a lot of kind of this lean startup and hypothesis-driven development being more and more popular, at the moment kind of product management does those tests separate from development. They ask for stuff, you know, developers deploy that, and then somebody concludes this was a good idea or not a good idea, where we'll be able to automate those things and deploy it to a test population of users. And if you're working for a company that's not like Facebook, so you can't really experiment on your real users, hopefully Apply tools and kind of mechanical Turk and things that will allow us to do kind of that kind of testing with statistically relevant numbers with test users. So, um, I think that's going to kind of start opening up some really, really interesting things because, um, you know, humans are unpredictable and with all the best intentions, people still have bad ideas about development. Um, Microsoft published a paper in 2009 called, uh, by, by a girl called Ron Kohavi. Uh, the paper is titled Online Experimentation at Microsoft and it t talks about uh, a research they've done looking at the PowerPoints that started various initiatives and figuring out a while later, did the things in the PowerPoints come through? And uh, their conclusion was that at Microsoft, about one third of initiatives they have actually create a positive result on the metrics they were supposed to improve. About one third don't create any statistically relevant improvement and about one third actually damage those metrics. And they also quote Amazon where they're religious about business testing every software idea. Does it create a behavior change for the users? No, not whether we've done what we plan to do. That's fine. But does this now allow users to buy more? Are the users completing the workflows faster? And they say that at Amazon, that's kind of completely religious about this, the success rate of ideas is slightly less than 50%. So if you are at all like Amazon or Microsoft, then about one half to two thirds of ideas coming into the pipeline are just crap ideas. They're not supposed to kind of live through the software and we're still paying for maintaining the software. We're still paying for testing all those ideas because nobody knows what worked, what didn't work. It's so expensive to test this stuff now. Where I think in the future, this is going to become ridiculously cheap to test as well. Um, Google is famous for this um, episode called uh, 40 Shades of Blue that came out a lot before the 50 Shades of uh, Grey and things like that. And um, th they had this um, fight between the designers and, and the developers where the head of the design, a guy called, I think, Doug Bowman, if I remember correctly, insisted that they change the color of the links for Google Ads on the homepage. And this was, I don't know, you know, change number 50 and the developers got a bit pissed off and they said, well, you know, why? And the, the, the designer said, well, this color is much more pleasing to the human eye. It's kind of a nicer blue color. People will notice this more. They will click more on this. And what the developers did, uh, given you know, that it's Google and they don't mind experimenting on users, is that night they divided kind of users into 40 categories and showed 40 different shades of blue to different users. And then they measured kind of in a statistically relevant way, do people actually click more on this link? And then they went back to um, the, the kind of Marisa Meyer, who was at the time at Google. And as a result of that, depending on kind of what you read, because it's kind of quite a well um, described episode online, there's lots of people kind of publishing stuff from both sides. Uh, the head of the design either left or was fired. And uh, there was a Guardian article about two years later where they uh, published some uh, financial figures from a Google conference. And apparently, the difference of putting that color on the website and running it for 100% of the users over a year would cost Google something about $250 million. So kind of the decision was relatively easy to make, but then, you know, this guy was a relatively good designer who I'm sure, you know, had a pretty good idea about a blue color that is amazing. 
and thought about putting it live. But think about how often you test stuff like that. You know, how often we get stuff from designers saying, oh, this is going to be much better, this is going to be beautiful, this is going to be amazing. And are we validating that at all? I mean, you know, if you look at the color theory and things like that, I'm sure that Doug's idea is, is solid, but humans are unpredictable. And they were not noticing his link. So Doug went on to work for Twitter, where they have amazingly blue colors now, but they still don't make money. So, um, and you know, I guess you know people have to learn one way or another. So, um, I think kind of stuff like this is going to become amazing in the future because it will become a lot cheaper, and we'll be able to test not just did we do what we wanted to do, but does it create the appropriate effect on the business. And we'll be able to automate those changes and put them into the system. So th the last thing that's really kind of happening here with cloud deployments, with cloud machines, with, with all sorts of weird stuff like that is we are being able to collect a lot more data. And we can process a lot more data a lot faster. You can get a two terabyte machine now and just run stuff on it in memory. And that's changing the kind of costs of doing big data processing. So I think big data is a um, really interesting opportunity as a buzzword for a lot of people to make money, but it's also a really interesting opportunity for doing testing. Um, they, there was this famous episode with Target in the US in 2012 where they sent some baby food coupons and, and nappy coupons to a girl who was 16 years old. And her father got really angry and started kind of um, went to the local target shop and started yelling at them for you know sending that to his daughter. And a week later, it turns out she's pregnant. Target was able to kind of figure out that she's pregnant based on her purchasing patterns before she knew she was pregnant, which is scary. Um, we have kind of um, you know the the the, the Google uh, machine beating uh, Lee Sedol in Go. And things like so machines are learning stuff, you know, faster than we can learn or coming up with connections that we can't even figure out. And um, I think what's going to happen is we'll start seeing that stuff applied to testing a lot. To come up with weird combinations, you know, feed it to the kind of Max Wolf thing, feed it a lot of databases of weird stuff, let it run on the cloud, and who knows what it's going to predict. Some weird pattern matching thing that, you know, is going to be impossible to know up front. Um, I, I saw a presentation by a gal, guy called Ma Mark Striebeck from Google who, in 2010, talked about how they were trying to kind of apply some basic uh, machine learning on their test cases. Now, this was 2010, so the big thing then was still kind of fighting spam. And what they did was they ran their spam algorithms on their test cases to try and figure out, you know, if they modified the same learning thing that detects spam, could something detect what's a good test case and what's a bad test case, like flagging spam? And because this is Google, they have you know, thousands and thousands of developers, they have who knows how many million test cases written so far, they could actually do that because they have a database of stuff to learn. And they created a relatively simple um, decision algorithm where if a test breaks, what's the first thing that gets fixed? Does the code get fixed or does the test get fixed? And they said if a test breaks and then the code gets fixed, that's a good test. But if a test breaks and you change the test without changing the code, that test wasn't that good because kind of it wasn't res resilient. And they ran the spam learning algorithms on that and they came up with a couple of really interesting conclusions. For example, uh, a really interesting spam filter was if a test has and in a name, it's likely to break more than the code. Which is kind of fair enough because, you know, we know that if a test tests multiple things, it's going to be brittle. But they also discovered some weird other things that were able to then assist their developers as they're writing tests around the same algorithm and say, maybe you don't want to write this test like this. Maybe you want to kind of write it slightly differently. And I think that something like that is going to become amazing both from a perspective of writing tests but also inspecting unknown things. I mean, if a computer can beat somebody at Go, a computer should be able to predict that putting a kind of half-completed link in Skype can break Skype. And th that's not at all far-fetched. So stuff like that was pretty much outside the reach of most kind of mortals today. You could play with that if you work at Google, you could play with that if you work at Microsoft or Apple, but most people wouldn't be able to do any of that. And 
what's happening now is stuff like that is becoming stupidly cheap and open source. For example, Google open source TensorFlow. TensorFlow is the key part of Google Brain. That's kind of the stuff that powers their ad networks and that powers all sorts of weird selections there. And you can, you know, you can get the code for this now and run it on Amazon's cloud, stupidly cheap. And let it run on, you know, as long as you have data to let it run on and you have kind of stuff that it can learn, you can pretty much benefit from the research that Google did in machine learning and apply it to your own stuff. Like usage patterns. Imagine that, you know, by tracking stuff in Track.js and tracking stuff with Google Analytics and tracking stuff with this and that, you can correlate that to your deployments and then inspect the code that went live. And then this thing can learn and say, well, every time you change this button here, our sales drop. Maybe you don't want to change that button now. Or every time you kind of change the colors here, something over there breaks and you have a bug report a week later. Maybe you want to test that area because you've changed the colors again. And kind of stuff like that will be, as long as we can collect the data and it's cheaper and it's easier to collect all the data, as long as we have data to feed this stuff, we'll be able to get it to come up with kind of weird conclusions we can't come up on their own. Of course, you know, if you don't like Google and you're more a Microsoft shop, Microsoft immediately open source their own thing. Because, you know, they're a very fast follower always. So there's a distributed machine learning toolkit that, oh, that Microsoft open sourced. And you can run it on Azure. You can run it on the Microsoft Cloud. Kind of same stuff. You can benefit from the research that people invested billions of dollars in. As long as you have the data to kind of, you know, let it learn. And some really interesting things are happening in this space already. For example, MIT um, recently published that they've taken pretty much all the code on GitHub and they ran it through a machine learning pipeline to see if they can detect and fix some bugs automatically. There's, you know, th th there's data there, there's who knows how many millions of lines of code, there's issue data, there's kind of a history of changes and things like that. And they've kind of, um, they actually have this fantastic article where they said that they were able to fix something like the 13 most common coding bugs automatically because they fed all this kind of data to it. Now, you know, if you're Google, you have tens of thousands of developers, you can feed stuff and, you know, it learns. But there's GitHub now that's publicly available. There's kind of code in the cloud for everybody to see. And as kind of what I really expect is going to start happening in the future is people will start using all this data that's publicly available. Or, you know, if, you're a big comp if you work for a big company, then people will be able to kind of use your own tests and your own code run it through these machine learning algorithms and then combine it with all sorts of weird analytics that you're now probably collecting already. And, you know, the machines are going to come up with weird stuff that is going to point us either in the direction of testing something or, you know, even maybe fix stuff automatically for us. So I think kind of we're going to get all sorts of kind of big data risk and threat modeling where, you know, you don't know that by changing this file, somebody else over there is suffering from some bugs occasionally, but it's going to tell you, hey, maybe you want to kind of explore this a bit more, or hey, you know, when you change the line of code like this, you typically kind of introduce a bug, so I'm going to fix it for you, or, you know, I'm going to do something. So there's, there's already um, stuff like there was this um, code assist editor that, as you're typing, looks up stuff on Stack Overflow and offers you to kind of paste directly. And kind of weird things like that. And of course, you know, if we're talking about the future, we all know that the world is going to end by somebody kind of pasting code from Stack Overflow that wasn't supposed to be there. But um, I, I think we'll start seeing a lot more in terms of kind of integrated workflow assistance like this. And we start kind of seeing this guy back in an editor <laughs> that is going to start suggesting weird stuff, but something really, really sensible. So th those are kind of my predictions for the future. And I think with a lot of these things, the tools are already there. They're not polished yet. They're not as cheap as they're going to be in five years' time. They're not kind of so nice that you have to use them. But if you're struggling from kind of front-end fragmentation, if you're deploying stuff on the cloud, if, if testing is stupidly expensive for you now, maybe investigating one of these tools and doing a bit of kind of sticky tape and glue and merging them together is going to save you a lot of money. And of course, if you're thinking about building one of these tools, like, you know, here are some really nice startup ideas. So that's pretty much it from me. Um, 
And thanks very much for sticking this slate. I hope there's some alcohol out there. And thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, my name is Gabriel, and um, I want to ask you a question from um, the position of a product owner. Recently, um, a month ago, I think, um, in our e-commerce platform, we implemented the rounding system. So basically, every product should have an uh, integer uh, price. Uh, it um, happened that we invested a lot in that to change all the pricing strategy on the platform. So basically after a week of programming and implementing testing and so on and so forth, we deployed, everything went okay. And two weeks after the business came and said, we want prices with 19.99 at the end. Mm -hmm. So we had to scratch everything and throw away like one week of programming for the entire Hopefully team. you were using a version control system. Of course we are. <laughs> Um, how would have you done it without investing so much effort in developing, in testing, and um, in deploying? So, but the, the pro so what, what went wrong? What, was it that you kind of um, the business didn't agree, and you implemented it from a perspective one person, and then other people didn't like it, or was it a unexpected effect on the business, or? What happened there? What was the kind of key problem? Uh, basically, when you're talking about a product that is one euro and 99, um, making it an integer, uh, like rounding it down to one euro, it's like uh, offering a 50% off rather mm. than uh, going from 99 euro to 98 euro. Okay. So it was basically... Uh, missing link that we never Okay, so Ki about. Kiran, Kiran talked about kind of behavior-driven development and, and things like that. And I think that that's, you know, pretty much a solved problem. What, what was there was, you know, people had a requirement that was half-baked in their heads and developers kind of misunderstood what rounding for the business means kind of because they were approaching it differently. So having conversations like, you know, behavior-driven development that. style... We did that. Uh, we expressed our uh, concerns about that, but um, eventually it all went live with the mission, let's see what happens. Okay, but you saw what happened. So you succeeded. <laughs> so, you know, whenever, that, that's, that's what kind of uh, Eric Ries talks about. If your deployments are all about, let's see what happens, that's exactly what you're going to kind of achieve. So without having a clear business expectation, like, the, you know, the stuff that they had at Google, people will click more, they will buy more, so you can actually test it on 1% of your users. You will never be able to prevent problems like that because it's unexpected. So what I would assume is maybe deploy to 1% of the users and measure against that and maybe not do it for all the products, but do it for some products to see if there's a business risk there, what's going to happen. So that would be one way of how people I work with would generally kind of approach something unclear like that. But... From what you're saying, I think kind of most of the problem was actually not having a good conversation there and not having anybody who kind of pointed out that 199 shouldn't round to kind of one, but it should round to two. So that, that was a missing part of the conversation. It's nothing to do with kind of testing tools. It's to do with kind of hiring people who can predict things like that for you. Okay, I understand that, which brings uh, to the uh, question I wanted to address initially after introducing the subject. Um, how would you have uh, tested in order to uh, avoid such uh, big implementation uh, in terms of uh, development? I mean, uh, again, it's kind of about, not about testing later, it's about coming up with these examples up front. What you're missing there is you're missing a part of the process where you can come up with those examples up front, where when people talk about behavior-driven development, they often talk about kind of tooling, but tooling only makes things faster. There's a ton of things that are really fast but horribly bad, like McDonald's. So kind of, and, and by, by looking at... Um, 
But, but by looking at kind of just the automation part, you make things faster. Unless you have good examples to automate, what's going to come out is fast food. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. So, you know, the, what, what's missing there is you need somebody in the company who knows how to test, unfortunately. And by getting that person involved before you start developing, you can pre prevent things like that. It's kind of none of the tools are going to help you there. You need to find the tester. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, hi, nice presentation. <laughs> like, um, uh, what do you think about recently launched uh, IBM Quantum Cloud Computing? Is it some future in it? or I, I don't know. I've, I've not really read too much about that. Uh -huh. I think kind of, you know, I, IBM's trying to kind of make money any way they can. They, they, all, all their businesses seem to be going down, so may, maybe that's going to save them, I don't know. <laughs> okay. uh, but it's, uh, I, I, again, it's, it's something that, you know, IBM is, is running the Watson service. They're kind of really going to the cloud as well. I think it's one of those things where maybe, uh, you know, if you have a use for a quantum computer to kind of do testing for you or kind of to suggest testing cases or, yeah. you know, th that I expect you'd be able to rent it for a couple of hours where yeah. instead of building your own computer, that's another opportunity that opens up. So I've not really read too much about that, but you know, m maybe, again, if, if, if they start to offer that on demand, it opens up some really interesting possibilities. Yeah, yeah. They, they give now like a chance to put something inside or to test it or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, another, that's another one of those things where stuff that was prohibitively expensive is becoming ridiculously cheap now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it would be good if you do something about that, you know, let me know yeah, so yeah. I can include it in my next talk. Okay. So good. Um, alcohol then. Thank you.